Is there anybody who didn't get the sample annotated bibliography last time? Has everybody got that? Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure. So I do have the sample final exam questions for you. you can probably figure out what text you might be able to plug into questions like this, right? And if you are prepared to answer three of them, then you'll be in good shape for the exam. There are four, though. Um, there will be, yeah, well, there will be three questions on the exam you'll need to answer two. Oh. So if you're prepared to answer three of these, then you'll be in good shape. So does anybody have any questions about the exam? That is, it's on the syllabus. <laughs> I don't remember exactly when it is. When are like the last days of class? Our last class meeting, I think, is the 8th yeah. of December. And then the final's on the 13th. The final's on the 13th, okay. And the yeah, and the paper is due, I think, on the 14th. Um, one thing I do want, I do want to quickly ask too, because um, people are going to have to start thinking about that final paper in the annotated bibliography. Um, does anybody need a quick refresher on the Galileo databases? Is everybody pretty, pretty well confident they can find sources? Okay, good. Um, I do want to remind everybody too though, one, go to the Writing Center, you get extra credit. And two, um, if you need help at all with the research, the person to contact is our reference librarian, John Wilson, at john.wilson at gsw.edu. You spend 10, 15 minutes with John, it'll probably save you a couple hours of research on your own. Right? He will be able to help you find the things that you need. Um, okay. There was something else that I wanted to bring up to all of you, and now I cannot remember what it was, so it can't have been that important. World you building did? assignment, maybe? The world building assignment thing, well, I, I, I remember that. <laughs> I remember that Grace is going to be uh, handling that today. Um, I'm trying to think if there was something else. That I, oh, um, right. Um, I'm not going anywhere over the holiday as well, so like, if you have questions about assignments, if you have questions about stuff you're working on, um, over the course of the break, um, I'm available. Right? I may not answer right away, but I will respond because I won't be traveling. Okay, so if there is no, uh, yeah, Ashley, go ahead. So we're supposed to have, a, are we gonna use the last day of class to do our like in-class DVD game? Uh, we will figure out a time for that, probably when we come back from the break. Okay. So it's something we'll probably have to do outside of regular class time. But um, and, you know, it's, it's like if, if you can't make it or you really don't want to do it, it's okay. You don't have to. I'm just you know, trying to include it as a kind of fun bonus to kind of, as a kind of place to culminate the course. And to actually put this world that you've put so much effort into building into use in some way. Okay. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else, then uh, Grace, why don't you tell us okay. about what you've done for today? Okay. So I have his world and so I made the physical I'll just start with the physical here so the men um I don't know why I thought this but the lava like the constant volcano in his world uh-huh so the men are like made from rocks like nice. kind of Ragnarok like Korg and Ragnarok <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was kind of thinking when I thought of the men. and the women are like these beautiful like like the tribes women are like these beautiful like leafy like almost earthly women like um i was thinking like tafiti from moana the, the little mountain lady uh -huh. they kind of look like that and the men wear like overalls and they're mostly like tattered looking kind of like dirty like just like dirty rock <laughs> men <laughs> and the women wear like white little dresses uh -huh. and they have headbands made from flowers because 
his world is like a sandy, like beachy, foresty world, so it's not mm -hmm. really that. I don't, I can't imagine it being that cold, especially okay. with the especially with the lava, yeah, prompting yeah. volcano. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, they are extremely advanced in technology. The women are like sort of the brains of the society, and the men are kind of the brew, okay. like strong forces. And on the eight borders of the islands, because this island has eight different borders, uh -huh. um, there is like a tower for each border, and that's where like the technology and like all the creation is being made and stuff. Okay. And um, they like build ships, like ships that are like super high, like technology ships that like can fly and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, to travel like distances or use for battles and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the men use the weapons and stuff when like they need to defend themselves from the other worlds that we've created. Mm -hmm. And the social and family structures, the families all live together, they're very civilized. The political system is kind of, so I took, in his world, they are not allowed to start fires to um, do, like to eat, okay. eat or anything. Because mm -hmm. when um, Disco started a fire, he was trapped under the sea. Okay. So the political system kind of fell into like a fire versus no fire people is what divides them. Nice. A lot of people want to rebel and they uh -huh. want to like say, screw it, let's create fire. Uh -huh. And for the others, they all fear the consequences and are like, no, let's just live without fire. We have uh -huh. the damn volcano. <laughs> it's really a rough thing. And so that's really what divides them. There's uh -huh. not like really like a set value of political uh -huh. belief. The, 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 that's that's kind of swifty and like the the big enders and the little enders. Uh -huh. where it's like which which side do you crack your egg on? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> I was I wasn't sure if Disco was still like alive or if that was like the legend of the creation of your island. It's ambiguous. Okay, so I I turned it into the people that don't like the fire. And everyone knows the legend of Disco and uh -huh. how he like was trapped and no one actually knows if. He Still trapped, but uh -huh. the people—that's what they fear. They, 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 the legend of disco. So, so it's they don't want to use fire. It, so it's become like a cautionary tale, yes. basically. Okay. And um, their moral values, while most attain the good moral values, the corrupt are trying to constantly persuade others to cr like create fires and stuff. Uh -huh. And like people have, and like just to see what happens and stuff, just try and get them to do it before they do it. Uh -huh. um, religion, they put their faith and the gods that control the sea. Okay. So like, I don't know, there's a lot of whirlpools in his world. I don't remember if it was because of some, I don't remember why it was, how there were uh, whirlpools. The towels. The towels? Yeah, the okay. towels that um, are ever absorbent, so they constantly <laughs> have the world. Right. I know it sounds <laughs> weird, but that's what no, I, I think that's cool. <laughs> So like, they put their faith in the gods that control the sea, because like, they're really uh -huh. scared of fire, so their safety net is water. Okay. And then the gods of fire, like, they're, like, evil fear gotcha. that they just uh -huh. don't like. Um, settlements, I kind of, I'm, I love Marvel, so, like, my kids have <laughs> to Marvel. I was uh -huh. thinking kind of like Wakanda, like, how they're very, like, still, like, traditional in the ways they dress and, like, warrior uh -huh. type thing but they're extremely advanced in technology. So like all of okay. their cities and stuff are all very like almost modernized, but they still live like super mm -hmm. like traditional warrior type style lives. Okay. Um, and all of their homes are elevated like with like super cool like technology shields to avoid in case the eruption of the volcano because mm -hmm. that Never <laughs> and um, the relations with neighbors, they don't trust anyone, uh -huh. and they avoid conflict at all times, although they could probably kick any one of our asses if they needed to. Okay. And economically, they're thriving. They provide a lot to like the neighboring villages because of how highly technologically uh -huh. advanced they are. Do, so are, yeah. are neighboring nations aware of how advanced they are? Do you want to keep the Wakandan theme? Yeah, mm -hmm. no. Yeah, but you're the Black Panther theme too. So, you want to? Uh huh. I feel like. 
Because I mean, like this, this is a, like this place is kind of off the beaten path, right? right. And they're secretive. And there's borders. And the little and everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So uh -huh. I'm gonna go with that. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a secret weapon. You know, it's also it's interesting. Like you say, like you 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 you're you're into the Marvel stuff because, like, when you're describing the men, I kept thinking the thing from the Fantastic Four. Or just like this this guy made of orange rock with blue shorts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 When she said cork, all I could hear was tequila and Ethan's voice. <laughs> oh man, you don't play me. You didn't start the fire. I'm gonna be so upset. That will be appropriate for your work. That will be appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in terms of what we're doing um, today, right? Um, now, everybody. We, so we, we've, we're, we're, we're finishing the parable of the sower, right? Um, is there anything anybody particularly wants to talk about in the last third of the novel, or particularly wants to ask about? Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think one thing we've probably already noticed is that um, the way people pair up seems to be like norms seem to have changed from what our like. For example, like within uh, Lauren's very insular, kind of insular neighborhood, most people seem to end up marrying their cousins, right? And there doesn't seem to be any social stigma attached to that. So it seems like as these kinds of, like, as institutions break down, so do some particular taboos about uh, sexual behavior as well, right? It seems like, like while, yeah, like, it seems, I mean, I'll be like, it, it, it seems, you know, creepy to me that a 57 year old man um, is starting a relationship with an 18 year old girl. That seems a little off, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't particularly seem to bother anyone in their group, right? And I think that part of the key there is that it is consensual and many of them have been in relationships that, are, that were not, right? So like we know, for example, the Gilchrist sisters um, had been forced into prostitution by their father. Um, you know, the uh, um, Travis and the Tivadad escaped their situation uh, because the master on the plant, basically plantation where they were working, had developed a sexual interest in the Tivadad, so they're trying to get away from him. Um, and uh, that, you know, Emery seems to have her son seemed to have been taken away from her for similar purposes, right? So I think that the kind of um, relative sexual freedom in you know, kind of letting people who letting people pair up in ways that we might think of as odd or even as I think one of you said like icky, <laughs> I think that that is meant to be in kind of contrast to the sexual slavery that a lot of people end up forced into. Because the, the Gilchrist, the, I feel like this last bit of the novel is extreme, like parts of it are super violent. Yeah. And graphic. Oh, yeah. Like the yeah. Gilchrist is just there to fall and kill their son, or kill their babies, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we don't see that. It's merely mentioned, right? But yeah. But I mean, even the imagery you get from yeah. that grief is uh -huh. still like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. But it's also animalistic in a way because, you know, yeah, that's actually a really good point. Yeah, that people are behaving more like animals, right? And in particular, that even like people who are in control of other people behave like animals, marking off territory, um, yeah, killing unwanted young, um, things like that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's actually that's I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah, the. Uh, um, the father's behavior is being like the kinds of things that male lions or even that male chimps do as well. And then it, re, it brings back that idea of 
um, what was it? It evokes the plantation culture, mm -hmm. but it shows I mean, like the really ugly side of plantation culture, with you know uh -huh. many of the women being a kind of like sexual slaves, because that's how a lot of African American women and even men were mm -hmm. treated. Sure. And then they didn't, if they got pregnant, they didn't get to keep the children with them. The children uh -huh. were sold off. Yeah, and I think another important, if we're kind of thinking along those lines, I think another important thing to note here is that two of the people, that they pick up along the way, both of whom have escaped from these kinds of plantation situations, right? Emery and Grayson are also both sharers. We're told at some point that um, the people who are running these operations like sharers because they're easier to control. Right? All you have to do is um, threaten someone next to them, right? someone they can see with pain, and you've basically got them do, ready to do whatever you want. And we learn more about having empathy mm -hmm. in this. Um, I think Henry tells Lauren that not all children of, of people with hyperempathetic threats get that gene, but there's kind of almost a genetic. Okay, yeah, then it seems like it might be genetic and might not be the result okay. of uh, her mother's drug addiction, right? Yeah. Yeah. That this is something that is passed down from parent to child, not necessarily a mutation caused by drug use. And like seeing that, that made me rethink, well maybe her mother was had, had high empathy, and maybe mm -hmm. she was reaching for the drugs to help like numb. Yeah, I mean that's one of the, why Bacole shows her where the painkillers are, right? Mm -hmm. And teaches her how to use them. So that if she ends up in a kind of sharing situation, she can dull the pain, right? And I think we see a, sort of con a kind of continued relationship as well uh, developing between the pyros and the street poor, right? Where apparently. Right, the pyros, these you know, crazy shaven-headed painted nihilists, will just wander in and destroy, right? The street poor now follow in their wake, looting whatever they can, right? So the street poor are coming to regard the pyros as heroes. Even though the pyros aren't doing this for them, right? They're not doing it for any reason except that, you know, the high feels good, right? The destruction and watching things burn feels good. So <clears throat> I don't want to keep you all too long today because I know like it is, you know, we're all tired. It has been a long semester. Um, and uh, everybody here, I think, deserves a little bit of a rest, right? But um, did you feel like this ended on a hopeful note or not? Okay, what, what was hopeful about it? Okay, yeah. Yeah, they make it to Bacoli's property. They decide to call it Acorn. Why do you think the name Acorn was, it sounds hopeful? Acorn's trying to destroy oak trees. Okay, yeah. And she wants a strong earth seed community. Mm -hmm. Plus the bread that she loves is okay. the acorn. <laughs> yeah, so the first, it's a memory. Yeah, there's a memory of home in there, right? Mm -hmm. A memory of the past, good. Um, and yeah, it's also yeah related to the earth seed philosophy, and that is basically what an acorn, like an acorn, is essentially a seed, right? That grows into um, <laughs> grows into an oak. And we also find that Lauren has has been carrying a lot of seeds with her. Right? Mm -hmm. 
So not only is she attempting to sow this earth seed philosophy, right? She is also, um, you know, she's also literally a sower of seeds. And what is, as she explains earth seed to the people she's traveling with, right? What do we figure out about this philosophy? What is her ultimate, what does she seem to regard as humanity's ultimate destiny? Change. Yeah, change, God is change, right? But there is something as well that she calls the destiny. Isn't it to end up among the stars? Yeah. This is the thing she started thinking about back when they canceled the Mars program, right? You know, back when she was thinking about that astronaut who died in that accident. Right, that the destiny, she believes human destiny is to spread out to other planets. And this place, Acorn, right, is a single spot from which to do this. But I think it's also kind of important to note like what Acorn is as well, as opposed to where many of these people are coming from. Right? Who's, where does, like, what, what seems to be the trend in farming and agriculture at the particular moment in history that the book describes? Okay, well, fruit, people have fruit trees on their own, on their own property, right? It's growing things that are strong, that don't need a lot mm -hmm. of hair or water. Uh-huh. But I think, like, if we're th thinking about, like, 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 agriculture on bigger scales, right? Like, agriculture not just for your own use, but for sale. Where is that happening? Who's doing that sort of thing? What did the company that bought Olivar want, ultimately? If we think back to last time. They wanted the clean water. They wanted the clean water because they want to dominate agriculture, right? They want, bless you, to take over all this fertile land in the Southwest that doesn't have any water, right? And they want to use the Olivar desalination plant as a kind of pilot project so they can figure out how to do this in other places, right? But yeah, so agriculture is largely being subject to corporate dominance, and it's being done on these large plantations like the one that Emory and Grayson escaped, like the ones that Emory and Grayson escaped from, right? So Acorn also presents an alternative vision to that <clears throat> corporate dominated agriculture, right? Essentially, like we've got a collective farm here run by a community of equals who are all voluntarily committing themselves to this project. So ACORN is almost like what we would call today, eh, what they would have called in the 90s when Butler wrote this too, um, an anarcho-syndicalist commune, right? right? No laws, no leaders. Everybody contributes their skills, agrees to chip in, right? And then definitely go over the time. What's that? And they always go well all the time. Always, yep, all the time, right? Although, actually, like, it's, they go all right more often than you think they do. Um, in fact, I would suggest um, there's a new book out. I know I've talked about David Graeber before, the Bullshit Jobs guy. Um, but he and an archaeologist have written a book together that tries to rethink the origins of human societies, right? That we tend to think that, you know, things started with barter economies. Although there's no actual evidence, um, archaeologically, of barter economies. 
Um, and um, what was the other thing? Um, they, they, they also note that there are, in fact, um, communities in the world today that have no real need for laws or leaders, but they tend to be small scale and uh, subsistence economies. So there's not much to compete over. So yeah, when you don't have much to compete over, these kinds of societies actually seem to be, th that seems to be the best condition for these kind of societies to work, right? But I think that in this case, what we have is a community of you know, like people who can't help sharing their emotions with others on, on the one hand, right? At the center of it. Um, and others who have voluntarily attached themselves to them. And I think that what this is supposed to be is a kind of counterweight to the revival of the plantation system that we see in other parts of California as the, uh, as the novel develops. <clears throat> She, die, she dies. In, That's true. Yeah, she does. Also, she she dies like three times yeah. in the course of their fight with the pyros, um, and returns. So yeah, there there is yeah that connection to yeah some of those old dying god myths I think as well so because she is the the prophet right of this earth seed religion yeah. And these dying god myths, at least in the popular imagination, if not necessarily in actuality, tend to be connected to uh, fertility ideas, right? I mean, she is a silver seed. Yeah. Okay, so. This is really all I wanted you guys to try to get out of this day. I want to try to take apart the ending a little bit, um, talk a little bit about some of these characters who were introduced in the latter part. Um, if you are, if you enjoyed this, if you are interested in this book, there's a sequel to it called The Parable of the Talents that further develops the earth seed religion and you know, kind of the future of this group um, that settles this acorn uh, property. The Parable of the what? The Parable of the Talents. And um, there was supposed to be a third book, but Butler died before she could write it. So the, if, you don't, if you don't like having a series interrupted, you know, then, <laughs> then may, maybe don't continue. But yeah, but I, but I, yeah I, I would suggest if you enjoyed this, check out The Parable of the Talents. She's been dead for a while. She has, yeah. In 2006. Mm -hmm. And I don't think she was that old either. Okay, so let me give you all the reading questions for Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. And because Jonathan Mr. Strange and Mr. Norrell is a doorstop, right, I would try to recommend um, using, like, getting through as much of it as you can during the break. It actually reads fairly quickly once you get started. I mean, the, the, fir the first time I read it, I read it in a couple of days, but I got... I got really into it. 